Gibraltar is experiencing an ageing population, as are so many other countries, with implications for pensions, benefits and government services. That's taken from Gibraltar's latest census from 2012. Our population is growing. The number of people aged over 65 is growing significantly. It's safe to assume that the number of people of a pensionable age is growing faster than the working population is. Our latest census data shows that there were significant changes from 1981 to 2012. The 15 to 64 age bracket grew by 18% while the 65-plus age group grew by 77%. Furthermore, a large portion of those in the 65-plus age category are retiring, having made full social insurance contributions, not least because more women are in full-time work compared to 40 to 50 years ago. This all means that the working population's social insurance payments are effectively having to go further. So much so that in the last 15 years or so, the government has had to use money from elsewhere to cover the growing cost of pensions. The top-up at the last budget was £30 million. The amount given by the state in old age pensions has been on the increase too. In 2006, a historic freeze brought about by the agreement with the UK as a quid pro quo for the UK paying for the pensions of Spanish workers in Gibraltar was removed. Old age pensions jumped by about 65%. Occupational pensions used to be taxed in Gibraltar. In 2010, however, in his penultimate year as Chief Minister, Sir Peter Caruana removed this tax. And despite the growing pressure on pensions and despite the government finances annihilating pandemic, at the last budget in 2021, the Chief Minister said he would not tax pensions. Many pensioners can work and are working in one form or another, professionally, and or as carers for grandchildren, they make invaluable contributions to society. Are they also generally better off than many of their European counterparts? We believe in the party that at the moment the, the best strategy short term and medium term would be to have a means tested strategy to make sure that people uh, with hardship or that their pensions aren't getting them to the end of the month are taken care of and supported. And I think that it's time to, for people who are in the much more wealthy bracket, who are wanting to claim community care um, pension uh, funds, to, be, to sit in solidarity with the people of Gibraltar and apply a level of collective responsibility. We understand that the way that this was managed was very unfair to people who, wealthy or not, may have budgeted f uh, based on this amount that they were going to receive. But look, it's happened now. The system is not fit for purpose anyway. And we have to look at each other and, and take this, uh, this collective responsibility. The chief minister has warned that it's dangerous for Marlene Hassan Naon and others not to see community care as independent from government. Here we go again with the, what is dangerous and what isn't dangerous because with that, with that mantra which we see everywhere in different areas of political discourse in Gibraltar um, it's very easy to silence people and keep the status quo. Given the demographic trends outlined together with the current external pressures on government finances including the pandemic and rising inflation and interest rates will the status quo need to be reviewed? In 2019, the GSLP Liberal General Election Manifesto said that they remained committed to equalising pensions and their aim was to equalise at age 60. The Finnish Centre for Pensions has a summary of pensionable ages across Europe in 2021. In the UK, it's currently 66 years and it's set to go up to 68 by 2046. In Spain, the age at which a person can withdraw a statutory pension without deductions for early retirement is also 66, set to go up to 67 by 2027. Well, equalisation, I don't think there's any argument against. We must be one of the few countries in the world where men and women have a different retirement age and it's discriminatory on men that they retire at one age and women on the other. I've not seen anyone try to change this. Everybody says they will. They could start tomorrow. We have to have equalisation of pensions because it's unfair. Which way that goes, I, I, you know, it depends on a number of factors. Uh, there's obviously uh, significant political factors that, that come into play. 
Um, but there's also major economic factors, and, and particularly at the moment, you know, in a situation where we have a, a, a local and global economy that's that's been hit hard by by COVID, that's uh, you know where we're talking about deficits um, at the moment. I, I think it's um, it would be a very certainly a very expensive exercise to um, to. to uh, to lower the, the men's pension age um, down to, to match that of, of women. Of course we would love to see the pensions, the, um, the age of pensionable age being reduced to 60 for men, but of course we don't know the true situation of our public finances. We don't even know what kind of uh, debts are hiding behind government companies, so we can't um, ascertain that this can be done or this is viable when we don't have the true picture. All we know is that if we brought down the, the age Age, the pressure and the expenditure, the recurrent expenditure, would be huge. So without that visibility, we can't really commit to that. Our aspiration as a trade union is for the pension age to be um, equalised at a reasonable age and for our members to have a reasonable pensionable income. We've been public in our statement that we think it should be equalised to 60. Um, and indeed, that's an aspiration that's been shared previously by the current government. Uh, they have publicly stated that aspiration. We do understand clearly that we've had COVID since those um, statements. That has changed the landscape. So there does need to be a full and proper and detailed conversation about what that pensionable age should look like, what is realistic, how is that going to be achieved? And that should be achieved for a full consultation. Therefore, that's why we look forward to um, the consultation to be released by government on this particular issue. It has to go up. I think it's completely unfair on those who are left behind paying taxes for it not to go up. Because if you bring the pension age down, those who do pay tax are going to have to pay much more. So it's unfair and it's completely unaffordable. There's no country in the world which is reducing their pension age. It's only going up. It's, it's a function of life expectancy. It's a function of affordability. And to even think we could afford it after 250 million on COVID is a bit of a nonsense. If it were to be a situation of, of increasing that, uh, that uh, the, the age of, uh, for women up to that of men, um, that, that poses its uh, other challenges. And, and you know, for women who have been planning for retirement, I mean, obviously that's, um, you know, that's suddenly it, it's an, an additional five years. Um, which, you know, which, which wasn't, uh, you know, which wasn't in, in the calculation to begin with. The Chief Minister and the Minister for Financial Stability have said salaries in the civil service are now well above parity with the United Kingdom, on average around 40% higher. Public sector pensions have long been tied to final salaries, meaning occupational pensions have been increasing too in the public sector. The, the problem we have at the moment is one that we are challenging currently um, through litigation is the fact that there is an enforced retirement age within Gibraltar for 60 for women and 65 for men. That means that workers in the private sector can be legitimately dismissed by their employers because of their age. And this is something that we are challenging because we believe it is age discriminatory. We believe it is in breach of the Gibraltar constitution. Um, it should be the workers' decision as to when they retire, not the employers. And those in the private sector have not had the opportunity to actually build up a decent pension. So therefore, we have a situation where a number of our members need to continue to work beyond 60 or 65 because of their economic situation, because of their personal circumstances. So, you know, the, the reality at the moment for a number of private sector um, employees is that the old age pension is not sufficient. Um, they need to continue working and therefore we do need to have a reform of the retirement ages within Gibraltar in terms of the compulsion by the, the employer to be able to retire members and dismiss them because of their age. Obviously the system doesn't work and we, we need an expert commission to come in and reform the pension system completely. I mean, it's just not right that a charity should be managing taxpayer funds to provide a lifeline to pensioners. And if we are so sure that our nation is so wealthy, why are we having these, uh, these amounts, these measly pensions offered to people who just do not get to the end of the month? There's obviously something that's missing. There's, the system is flawed. The, the, the welfare system in this case is absolutely flawed and we need to we need to look beyond it. So obviously a together Gibraltar government would um, would bring in an expert commission in order to find a system that is designed to offer um, uh, dignified pensions to private sector workers that does not discriminate in gender or nationality.
It's also true that the cost of living is going up. According to the Financial Times, the recent surge in inflation could prove a real challenge for pension schemes, especially if it proves not to be a transitory phenomenon. Russia's invasion of Ukraine will likely exacerbate this further. Public sector uh, individuals have, have generally not had to worry about, about their pension arrangements. They've known it's going to be there when they retire. In the private sector, that's a very different situation. Employees um, have had to uh, have had to put a either have had to plan for this, or, or they've you know they've got a, quite a shock at the end if, if they haven't planned for it because um, um, they have to rely on on the, the state pension, which uh, which for many people will, will not be sufficient. Uh, as the GFSB, we we, um, we, we lobbied for. Uh, for smaller businesses to, to be given uh, more time to, to, be, to implement the, the requirements of the Private Sector Pensions Act. Um, so we're very happy that uh, that, that, that was um, catered for in, in the legislation. The very smallest businesses, being those with fewer than, than 15 employees, um, they don't have to do that until 2027. At least there, there is time uh, to be able to plan for that. So in terms of the economy, I think it's very fragmented. Tourism and retail obviously really, really hit. Our world, my world, which is property, is, is doing really well. Why is it doing really well? Because Gibraltar is attractive to worldwide investors or incoming employees. So we've got to congratulate ourselves or those who have made certain decisions. Well done, Gibraltar. We're, we're um, attractive. So that is good, uh, but not all parts of the economy are doing well. Nobody can be surprised about 250 million or 200 million on COVID. That's happened to every country in the world. And at least we've got some snippets of good news. We just have to use the money wisely as best we can. And that's up to the politicians. This is not a comprehensive overview. There is more, much more to say on this matter and others are better placed to explain this than myself. But it should serve to provide some context for the situation of pensioners in Gibraltar. And perhaps it even begs the question, can Gibraltar continue to pay public sector pensions at current levels?